Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the CIC Imaging Series. So I'm Ariel. I'm a research assistant at the Raja Lab in, at the CIC, and I'll be moderating today's talk. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rachel Buckley. Dr. Buckley is an assistant professor of neurology at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Dr. Buckley is a recipient of the NIH NIA K99 R00 Pathway to Independence Award, as well as an Alzheimer's Association Research, Research Fellowship. Her research focuses on sex differences in Alzheimer's disease co cognitive and biological markers, as well as exploring elements of resilience and vulnerability to Alzheimer's, particularly in women. To address these questions, Dr. Buckley uses cognitive and neuroimaging data harmonization approaches to align multiple independent data sets together. Dr. Buckley is originally from Australia and completed her training, um, PhD training in neuropsychology at the University of Melbourne under the mentorship of Professor Michael Saling. Her postdoctoral training was with Dr. Reza Sperling in the Harvard Aging Brain Study, where she now co-leads the data and informatics team. So we are very excited to have you here today, Dr. Buckley, uh, to discuss sex differences in vulnerability to amyloid beta and tau pathology. And uh, just before we begin, um, I just want to remind everyone, uh, Dr. Buckley mentioned that everyone can ask questions throughout the talk. So feel, uh, please feel free to post them in the chat and I will read them out. Otherwise, I'll be monitoring the ha raised hands. And uh, please be sure to keep your microphone off during the presentation. And so with that, I will hand it off to you, Dr. Buckley. Ariel, that is such a kind introduction. Thank you so much. And it's uh, such a pleasure to be invited to something like this, especially by uh, someone as yourself, because um, you never really know to what extent your, your work is reaching out to others. So that's, it's really wonderful. And uh, Natasha is a, an excellent scientist, and I've had such pleasurable interactions with her on Twitter. So um, hopefully uh, today what we'll do is have a bit of a um, uh, an introductory session into sex differences, particularly in the space of preclinical Alzheimer's disease. Um, but really, you know, this is an ongoing discussion. This is an area that is um, sort of a hot, hot area at the moment. And uh, there's things changing and unfolding and being learned as we go. Uh, so if anybody has any questions or any um, suggestions for taking next steps, uh, please shout out or uh, please do reach out to me on Twitter. I'm quite active on Twitter as um, Sylvia and a few others may already know. Um, and I really love to have discussions whether via direct message or, or openly online. So feel free to reach out anytime. Um, so first of all, um, we're going to start out, and I know that quite a few people on this call will be familiar with Alzheimer's disease, but I like to just sort of give a brief overview anyway. Um, so Alzheimer's disease is an insidious uh, disease that involves um, a very sort of um, somewhat characteristic clinical trajectory of very early decline, particularly in episodic memory domains, as well as some executive function domain. Um, and it usually, you know, these sorts of um, changes occur uh, quite early in tandem with neurodegeneration um, and also other markers of pathology. Um, and then uh, eventually over time will affect other cognitive domains. Um, Alzheimer's disease uh, forms a, a predominant um, component of the um, underlying dementias. There are a few different, um, you know, causes of dementia, but Alzheimer's disease certainly makes up a large uh, majority of it, with the uh, characteristic hallmark pathologies being um, the amyloid, um, the beta amyloid plaques, which you can see on this right hand side figure being the, the purple um, sort of light pinkish um, dots here, uh, and the tangles, these sort of darker blue um, smudges the neurofibrillary tangles. Um, so the amyloid and tau pathologies are really uh, of, of great interest to the field in terms of trying to characterize how um, the disease progresses. And from the point of um, the earliest time of amyloid accumulation um, all the way through to a diagnosis of the clinical dementia, you can think of the, um, the onset or the duration of that disease uh, takes approximately 20 to 30 years. Um, and uh, to, in order to sort of visualize the earliest stages of the disease, um, we tend to focus a lot on um, in vivo markers 
Uh, we have lots of different types of markers of amyloid and tau. Uh, cerebrospinal fluid has been around for a long time. And you may have also seen plasma markers have, have um, started to become quite popular. Uh, but here, in, in the work that we tend to do um, at Massachusetts General Hospital, we tend to focus a lot on positron emission tomography or PET neuroimaging. And the rationale behind that is because you can see uh, the proteinopathies uh, where they're topographically distributed. And so we focus a lot on the amyloid and tau traces. Um, for the purposes of the talk today, I'll, I'll really refer to um, you know, PIB traces and flatosapir traces. Um, what I wanted to point out here is for those who are less familiar, um, in, with amyloid load, we tend to see a very large, so very early on in the, the disease process, amyloid sort of takes on um, most of the cortical regions in the neocortex. Um, so it's sort of a global pathology fairly rapidly. There are some suggestions that there might be some regions that are particularly affected, but um, all in all, it's quite a global phenomenon. Whereas the earliest stages of tau deposition are quite focal early on in the disease, um, focused very much in the medial temporal regions, um, and then slowly sort of moving out of the limbic regions into to the neocortex. But early on, we're focusing on regions like the entorhinal cortex um, and other areas of the hippocampal formation, just to get people sort of um, situated. And what I'm particularly interested in, in my area of research is um, women's risk for dementia. Um, and the reason is because it's been known for a long time that the prevalence of um, uh, AD dementia in women is much greater than men. So for all of the individuals, particularly in the US who are living with dementia currently, about two thirds of those are women. And another very important point um, about this disease uh, that, that really doesn't get as much coverage. And unfortunately, I won't be touching on it in my research either, but I think it really bears uh, acknowledging is that actually at least nearly two thirds of caregivers are also women, caregivers of patients with dementia. And I, I, so there really is um, a lot of uh, burden on women with this disease from both sides. And it's really important to recognize that. So today I'm going to be focusing, as I said, on sex differences um, in risk, uh, but in particular, my area of interest is looking at in risk of exhibiting the pathology um, and how that might impact our interpretation of the extent to which the sexes differentially display resilience or vulnerability to the disease. And I know that sounds a bit odd because I keep saying that women are at risk of the disease, but actually there's quite a lot of interesting evidence to make you ponder the opposite uh, end of the spectrum, considering that women might in fact be resilient to the disease. Um, and just to be uh, clear as well at the outset of this talk, I'm going to refer very heavily to the idea of sex being a biological variable, but I do obviously recognize um, that there's a very important um, impact of gender as well, although I won't be really re referencing it too much in the talk today, but it's important to recognize. And I'm going to inter interchangeably refer to males and females as well as women and men, even though I know that um, you know there are different ways of being able to see these uh, terms, um, but just to be aware of that. I'm happy to talk about that more at the end of this talk if anyone's interested. But first of all, I wanted to sort of focus on the epidemiological findings um, and then move my way through to the biological markers. Um, epidemiological studies um, suggest that women have higher clinical progression and mortality rates for AD dementia relative to men, but this is debated in the literature to some extent. So um, on the study on the left-hand side, you'll see incidence rates for new diagnoses of AD dementia for the European population cohorts on the top panel and on the bottom panel for the US cohorts. And the takeaway point from this figure, which I'm sure you can clearly see, is that the incidence rates are near parity uh, between the sexes in the US, while in Europe, this is where we actually see quite um, large divergences, particularly after the age of 80. And so what I'm tr really trying to um, highlight here is that it's actually kind of hard to pin down the extent to which uh, women show higher risk for incidence rates to dementia, um, particularly if you look across countries. Um, in the figure on the right, this is mortality data uh, from every death recorded in Australia between 2006 and 2014. And here in this study, we found that even after adjusting for age at death, 
which a lot of people suggest is an issue when thinking about prevalence. So women might just have higher prevalence for dementia because they simply live longer. So in this study, we adjusted for longevity. Um, and we also adjusted for other uh, potential confounds like um, uh, vascular related deaths. The argument here is that maybe men who could have had higher risk for progression to dementia, um, they simply died earlier because of a vascular, vascular related issue. Um, we adjusted for vascular related deaths as well. And we found that even after adjusting for these comorbidities, females remained at a higher risk of dying with dementia after the age of 80. So I guess what I'd like to say here is there is some degree of evidence at a population level of sex differences in risk for AD dementia, but it does really depend on context and it's important to bear that in mind. Now, a few years back, um, there was a really critical research framework published by the NIA and the Alzheimer's Association that proposed new ways of thinking about and operationalizing AD biomarkers. Um, and uh, this framework specifically highlighted markers of amyloid and tau and neurodegeneration to help identify individuals who might be at greatest risk for uh, future progression to the dementia. And the reason that I wanted to bring that up here is actually because of this fantastic paper that came around, came out about the same time by Brookmeyer and colleagues. And what they were doing was they were simulating the lifetime risk of progressing to uh, Alzheimer's disease dementia. And they broke it down uh, by age and by sex. And what I'm going to be focusing on today is what's inside the green box. So uh, the simulation of going from a state of normality to a state of having amyloidosis, so that's uh, just having elevated levels of amyloid, to then moving on to elevated levels of amyloid and neurodegeneration. Um, this was based on hippocampal volume or gray matter volume. And then moving to a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment, so showing some uh, cognitive issues already alongside amyloid and neurodegeneration. And finally, then moving to the AD dementia. Um, and what they found uh, is that across all these states, women, oh, this is um, quite squished, so apologies for that. I should have checked that before I, I showed this slide. But what, what you would notice is that women actually are much higher in their lifetime risk of progressing to AD dementia across all the ages. But this is most clear, unfortunately not for you guys, but state four is the most um, likely state at which women are more likely to show higher lifetime risk of, of progression. Um, and, and this is the point at which they have both amyloid and neurodegeneration um, and then progressing to mild um, cognitive impairment. And for me, this was quite an interesting finding because it suggests that the risk, the sex, the risk for sex differences um, uh, for AD dementia seem to be pervasive across most of these stages, but may in fact be most highlighted at the point when amyloid may have already started to accrue. Um, and I think it's a nice early demonstration of how sex differences in inc incidence rates might be a result perhaps of differential clinical outcomes to the pathological load. Now, as I said, while the literature is somewhat debated about incidence at the epidemiological level, the data is actually a lot clearer if you think about the intersection between sex and the genetic risk for, spor for sporadic uh, Alzheimer's disease. So the apolipoprotein epsilon-4 allele is a well-known risk factor for sporadic AD dementia for both the sexes, but multiple population level studies for a few decades now have suggested that the odds ratios are much higher for progressing to the dementia if you are a female who carries at least one ApoE4 allele. Um, and this is particularly true if women carry two ApoE4 alleles. Um, this is a recent example here by Mu and Pa um, that was published a few years back um, that looked at uh, about 53,000 individuals across 23 different cohorts um, and looked at incidence rates of progressing to MCI or AD dementia. And they found that women were at greatest risk of progressing uh, to the dementia, but uh, over and above that of men who carry an ApoE4 allele between only the ages of 65 and 75. 
And I found this to be really fascinating because it really suggests that there might be a critical window for when sex related risk for the dementia may be at its highest. So let me just sort of demonstrate what I mean by that. So as I said to you before, the insidious sort of onset of the uh, amyloid um, component of the disease if we assume that amyloid begets tau, begets neurodegeneration, which then sort of um, manifests itself clinically towards a dementia, you're looking at a, at a disease that can take anywhere from you know, 20 to 30 years um, up to this red line here, which is the point where you're, you're on average um, an Alzheimer's disease dementia patient with a very high level of amyloid burden. And if you assume that this 65 to 75 odds, um, odds of progressing age gap is, um, is something to, to take seriously as um, a female risk, if we remove just 20 years from that time, that takes us to 45 to 55 years of age. And we know that 45 to 55 years of age is that critical window when menopause um, uh, onset uh, happens in most women across the globe, uh, which really I think is quite an interesting um, early marker or early um, sort of sign that maybe there's something under the hood, uh, so to speak, when thinking about what might be the biological mechanism that is increasing, potentially increasing risk uh, in women for the disease. So those findings that I was showing was largely at a population level. But now what I wanted to turn to was the observational studies of sex differences. So here, the picture is also somewhat nuanced, um, which is interesting. And that the point that I'm going to make in this particular slide is that for patients with a dementia diagnosis, women show, tend to show worse cognitive outcomes than men for a given level of pathology but that in fact, healthy women may show a resilience to the disease markers relative to men. So for instance, this paper Col Coldwell and colleagues published a few years ago showed that healthy older females exhibited um, a relatively preserved memory performance. So along this y-axis here, a higher score is worse performance. So women, regardless of their level of pathological burden, the red box indicating abnormal levels of um, amyloid, uh, amyloid and tau uh, on, uh, on CSF uh, measurement. So women showed actually preserved memory performance. And this has actually been shown across the, the, the board. This is a well-known finding that women tend to retain their level of cognitive performance. Um, they tend to perform much better in verbal memory tasks than men, um, particularly uh, memory, verbal memory tasks. Um, but then by the time you get to a point of a, a dementia diagnosis, this disparity um, really starts to come out that women who have these abnormal levels of cerebrospinal fluid markers really start to show very um, poor outcomes. Uh, men were already showing these uh, early on, but women start to catch up as they transition to a dementia diagnosis. Um, and all the previous findings that I was showing before was cross-sectional, but what you really want to see is a longitudinal example of this potential loss of um, resiliency. Here, what we examined was cognitive trajectories of nearly a thousand older adults who started out as clinically normal and then were followed for approximately six years. We grouped them according to their level of Alzheimer's disease risk based on APOE4 status and um, also on global amyloid burden. So amyloid positive indicated um, abnormal levels. Um, what we found was that women, as I had just mentioned before, they actually performed a lot better on the whole, a lot better at the cross, at the cross section um, when they were entirely healthy at the, at the baseline of the study. Um, but in fact, over time, it was the women who um, uh, represented or manifested both of these risk factors. They, had, uh, they were an APOE4 carrier and they exhibited abnormal amyloid. These women showed much faster rates of cognitive decline than any other group even men who were E4 carriers and were also uh, high amyloid. And this provides, I think, a hint as to where women are headed as they progress towards a diagnosis of dementia. So they might have higher levels of resilience at the outset, but there might be some loss of compensatory mechanisms with um, the encroaching disease. So where might this vulnerability be coming from? Well, 
post-mortem findings, um, they've been quite fascinating because they re reveal uh, a very interesting pattern that tau might in fact be uh, the leading cause. Um, so Liesinger and colleagues um, on the left here showed that uh, they actually replicated previous um, epidemiological work suggesting that past the age of 80, women uh, had much higher likelihood of autopsy confirmed Alzheimer's disease than men. But what I wanna focus on here is, is this um, sort of middle left panel. And uh, what they found was that even though men and women, and I'm not showing that here, but men and women didn't show differences in their levels of amyloid plaque density at death. But across almost all the age ranges, women showed much higher levels of um, neurofibrillary tangle density, particularly in this sort of browny yellow color, the subiculum, which is right near the entorhinal region. So a very early area for um, uh, tangle uh, deposition and in the CA1 region, which is in the hippocampal formation, you'll see there's much higher levels in women than in men. And in particular, they noted that these differences were quite elevated uh, post 80 years of age, but also in this 50 to 69 age region, which is uh, again, very interesting given the sex by E4 findings I was just showing you, this critical 50 to 70 years of age. Um, which we'll be touching on again when we talk about the hormone findings. And this was uh, replicated by Overskaren in a totally different um, cohort, the ROSMAP cohort, uh, again showing these very elevated levels of tau pathology in women relative to men. So the next question is, can we then see some of these findings in vivo? Um, and uh, in fact, we can. So this first finding here, uh, I just wanted to sort of replicate uh, and really sort of drive home the point that in older adults, women do not show any convincing evidence of having higher levels of amyloid than men. They're absolutely across the board in most studies. On the right-hand side, this is the largest study that's been conducted looking at this with the A4 baseline data in about 4,000 individuals. Um, and looking at differences in amyloid burden between women and men, and there really is not much. Um, although I will refer to some middle-aged results in a second that are kind of interesting there, but at the older adult stage, we don't really see anything. But when we go into tau markers in vivo, this is where things start to get very interesting. So using cerebrospinal fluid markers of tau, um, uh, multiple studies now have consistently shown sex differences in levels of total tau, particularly if the woman is an E4 carrier. So this is a meta-analysis that I'm showing here, um, conducted by Timothy Homan and colleagues um, a few years ago, that showed that women who were E4 carriers exhibited much higher levels of total tau and phospho tau, uh, the non-carriers that were female and also males that were either um, E4 carriers or not carriers. And also in the cerebrospinal fluid, they found no sex differences in uh, levels of amyloid. And now, uh, and in the last few years, there has been a lot of emerging evidence now suggesting that women show also higher levels of tau pet signal. Um, now, the great thing about tau pet, as I said earlier, is that you can see, you can talk about the pathology, so uh, the, the anatomy, so where the deposition is really occurring. And so what, what our early studies really focused on when we were doing these analyses is we really focused on these hot regions down the bottom here. This is sort of the entorhinal, hippocampal sort of formation area. And you can see here, there's clear sex differences. Anything from a blue all the way up to a red is showing signal, tau signal that is higher in women relative to men. And so there's definitely sex differences there. But the thing that really struck us, this was a paper we published a couple of years ago, the thing that really made us sit up and take notice was that tau deposition was actually different across the sexes, across a lot of different cortical regions. We're talking uh, temporoparietal, occipital, anterior frontal. At the beginning, we were actually quite nervous about this finding. Uh, we thought that there was a lot of noise in the PET signal that might be driving these findings. And if anybody would like to ask me about this later, we did a massive deep dive on this. Um, uh, but suffice to say, even after thinking about 
potential noise in the neuroimaging, um, there definitely is still some uh, tau differences across many of these regions. They still remain. So taken together, these findings with the postmortem and the biofluid um, evidence suggest that there's an intriguing levels of susceptibility for um, to tau in women relative to men. And studies are now also suggesting that women might show faster rates of tau accumulation over time, uh, particularly if they have risk factors, like um, in this particular case, if they're an ETH, uh, if they're uh, if they have high amyloid burden. So here, Smith and colleagues um, using the BioFinder cohort showed that individuals with abnormal levels of amyloid, in individuals with abnormal levels of amyloid, women show uh, slightly faster uh, rates of accumulation accumulation relative to men and uh, anyone who is low in amyloid. Um, and these are really, I think, the very convincing evidence to me, at least at the outset, early on preliminary evidence, because cross-sectional findings are great, but they come with um, issues, potential issues of survivor bias. And I can talk more about this at the end of the talk. But essentially, if you're seeing differences across, uh, longitudinally, it might uh, sort of make you feel more comfortable that there's actually something biologically different, um, you know, pathologically different going on, um, rather than just suggesting, well, some of the men that could have been a part of this study uh, have either already been diagnosed or have uh, not been included in the study for some reason. And there's also now evidence, uh, this is some of our work, uh, again, from a couple of years ago, showing that in, if, if both men and women already have higher levels of tau, women are showing much more vulnerability to that, that they are showing much uh, faster rates of accumulation. This is the upper, this is the higher level of tau signal in both men and women. And this is the predicted rate of change in women um, and the predicted rate of change in men, you can see that it's very interesting. Men almost seem to be staying stable um, over time, even if they have higher levels of tau. Um, so again, tying this together with the idea that this higher level of tau is having a knock-on effect and what might be driving um, higher incidence rates in women. So sort of just to, to pull all of these uh, findings together, we seem to have a few um, pieces of the puzzle now. So we don't really see, at least in older adults, we don't really see differences in amyloid load between the sexes, um, but there might be some point at which we hit an abnormality threshold, which tips women over the edge and causes a much faster or greater tau proliferation, not just in the medial temporal regions, but throughout the brain, um, which is then leading into a knock-on effect of faster cognitive decline in women and potentially to um, higher rates of progression uh, to the dementia. So now that I've sort of painted that picture, I wanted to now turn to the question of what might be driving these differences. Um, any questions at this stage? Okay. So clearly the features that set men and women apart at a biological level are hormones and genes. So what I wanted to do today was to sort of focus on some recent examples um, from the literature that try to tackle the issue of what might be driving uh, this greater vulnerability or resilience um, to the disease, um, thinking in specifically about sex chromosomes and hormones to try to answer the question or understand the question. So first, you know, I want to focus on the idea of resiliency because it's so fascinating. We can't really ignore the issue that across the world and indeed across most species, that women live longer than men. And the same is in fact true when you consider survival rates with dementia. So on the right hand side here, um, and I'm thinking about sort of length of time that someone can live with the disease or the dementia once they are diagnosed clinically. Um, and on the top uh, right in the, the orange um, sort of bar and on the bottom in the blue are women 
and they are showing much uh, longer estimated life expectancy and median time of survival than men. Uh, here, the men are in the blue bar and the green line. And the question is here, all right, well, if we, I've been painting this huge picture now, this whole talk about vulnerability, but how is it that women are living longer, both with the disease and without? What's going on there? So this study on the left-hand side is a really cool uh, bit of science that I'd never quite understood until recently. Um, and that is that longevity isn't actually about being female, uh, not necessarily. So it's about actually having the extra copy of a sex chromosome. And across most species, males are heterogametic, meaning that they hold two different sex chromosomes. And in the case of humans, males are XY. And so here you can see the heterogametic uh, sex here is uh, living. So if you're on the right hand side of this graph, you're uh, dying off earlier. And you can see if you're heterogametic across most species, you're, uh, you're, living, uh, you're, you're not living as, as long. But in fact, not all species follow this rule. And there are some species that are female heterog heter heterogametes. So uh, some examples of that are birds, uh, moths, and some fish. And here in these particular species, life expectancy is shorter in those females. Um, as you can see here, those females are indicated in the red. So why might this be happening? Well, one hypothesis for this is called the unguarded X hypothesis. And it suggests that reduced or absent second sex chromosome in the heterogametic sex might lead to these organisms being more likely to express undesirable morphological and physiological characteristics. But on the flip side, you can see what might be occurring as a built-in redundancy for, for human females, for instance. If you have two copies of the X chromosome, then you have uh, an ability to uh, um, compensate for the fact that one may have some mutations on it that are undesirable. Um, so you obviously get one X chromosome from a mother and one from a father if you're female. And across all cells in the body, um, in women, human women, um, one X will be randomly silenced in order to not overdose the gene expression from the X chromosome. But this is where it gets really cool because when that second X chromosome gets randomly silenced, not all of the gene expression is stopped. In fact, some escape inactivation and some genes, in fact, across many women um, in the population and across many tissues and across many cell types, some genes escape inactivation quite consistently. Um, and this has gotten scientists very excited because it, of what it might mean for resiliency in females. Specifically, um, they've tried to use animal models to try to test this effect of the uh, XX chromosome and the potential outcomes for AD risk. But one problem is how do we actually pull apart the gonadal effect, so the hormone, sex hormone component from the uh, sex chromosome component? And there's a very famous approach, which some may be familiar with, but I wasn't until recently. It's called the four core genotype uh, approach, where what they do is they cross um, the XX and the XY with um, the gonadal type. And so you end up with this um, four way matrix of different types of mouse models. And what they do, how they do that is they turn on and off the SRY gene, um, whether or not there's an XX or an XY mouse. So now you can end up with an XX, uh, uh, XX mouse, so X chromosomes both, but with male gonads, or an XX uh, female with, um, without the, with the female gonads. And so now you can test actually the main effects of the hormones and the sex chromosomes and their interactions. And so a study by Emily Davis and colleagues published a really interesting study um, that examined this four core genotype mouse model that produces AD pathology. And what they were really interested in was looking at survival. And what they found was that in fact, the, the most likely outcome for survival, the biggest impact of survival was in fact, the, um, the, uh, the sex chromosomes. There was an interaction between the two, but the sex chromosomes was the really big driver. And, what the, and not, the, not the hormones. And the thing they wanted to try to understand better was, uh, is it in fact the uh, Y 
or is it in fact the X chromosome that's the problem? Is it having a Y that's the issue or is it having the um, extra X is protective? And so what they then did is they created another um, sort of four, four way interaction where they had uh, an XX mouse, an XY mouse, an X with nothing else mouse and an XXY mouse. And the mouse that tended to survive the least or have the poorest outcomes was the one with only one X. Um, it didn't really matter if there was a Y involved, so there was no real impact of the Y, but it really mattered that there was only one X um, associated. So then they started to think, well, what might be on the X that could escape an activation quite consistently? And there's one uh, particular um, uh, gene uh, that tends to be quite popular in the literature. It's called KDM6A. And they wanted to see whether holding um, the KDM6A SNPs um, might in fact confer resilience. So this is the ADNI data set. They looked at change in MMSE from uh, across the whole um, of the ADNI uh, duration of the study and found that those people with a certain type of um, uh, sort of uh, uh, mutation of, on this uh, SNP actually showed resiliency and in fact showed practice effects on the MMSE relative to the reference which showed decline. So it suggests that there's an interesting idea of this sex chromosome and that maybe there might be some uh, escaped inactivation component to that. But of course the story isn't just about resilience to longevity and I just wanted to show some other examples um, where this is sort of Tim Homan's group's work where they're looking at genetic associations, um, uh, sex specific genetic associations with um, total tau in cerebrospinal fluid. Um, and what they found was that there was a particular locus on the autosome that differentiated the sexes in their levels of tau burden. Um, and further, that gene expression on um, this particular, on examples of this particular locus was um, associated with um, differential levels of um, neuro neurofibrillary tangle burden between men and women. And so it really suggested that women may show lower levels of tau deposition if they have higher gene expression um, based on these two different genes where men didn't really show any association, really highlighting the sort of sex specific um, genetic susceptibility to AD. And um, it's, it's not just one way. I talk a lot about women in this talk, but you should also note that there are quite a few sort of genetic susceptibilities for men. So for instance, um, the APOE4 allele for men is actually associated with um, greater cerebro uh, microbleeds. And also there's a story emerging also about, um, estra, uh, about TREM2. Um, the, the idea is that um, there might be increased levels of S-TREM2 in cerebrospinal fluid that's associated with CSF um, tau markers, but only in men and not in women. So I suppose I wanted to sort of round out this genetic section by saying that the story is still being pieced together and there's a lot of moving parts that still need to be better understood. But when thinking about the story of the hormone piece, Lisa Moscone's lab have published some really interesting work um, looking at how uh, markers of um, uh, amyloid burden, um, white matter hyperintensities, uh, glucose hypermetabolism, um, and a gray and white matter volume might actually be differenti differentiated across the different um, stages of menopause. So this is very early work by Lisa Moscone's group. And essentially they were showing that in menopausal women, um, these are women that are a couple of decades younger than the older adults that I was showing you before, but that there might be higher levels of cortical amyloid in these post-menopausal to menopausal women relative to age-matched men, as well as um, these other women who are in uh, different stages, earlier stages of menopause. And on the right hand side here, this is work that we have just had published, um, which was very exciting because all of the work that's been done in menopause, looking at AD uh, risk has focused a lot on amyloid, but what we really wanted to focus on was tau. On the y-axis here is one region of tau, um, the inferior parietal. This is a region that tends to show a lot of sex differences in tau. And what we found was that there was no difference in, uh, in levels of tau between uh, women who were premenopausal and their age matched male controls. But once you get to a postmenopausal stage, 
women show much higher levels of tau than the male uh, postmenopausal group and also the premenopausal groups as well. And this suggests that there might actually be some interesting um, associations between menopause stage and, uh, and tau pathology. This is work uh, now that's uh, been extended from that paper that we just did. This is uh, work done by my postdoc, um, Dr. Gillian Coughlin, uh, looking at uh, slightly different markers of menopause. It's, it's fine to look at menopause status, but let's think more uh, seriously about what it might be that's driving that. Here, we wanted to look at how long you've actually been um, exposed to estrogen throughout life. The idea being that if you've had more estrogen throughout your life, you may have um, a greater protection from AD risk. Uh, that would mean that earlier age at menopause um, would be associated with higher levels of tauopathy. And what you can see here on the y-axis is a whole bunch of different regions of um, that we tend to see consistent sex differences in tau. And on the x-axis is different levels of PIB. Um, that's the amyloid burden. And what you can see here is that in, in all individuals who have higher levels of the amyloid, um, the women who have um, earlier age at, age at menopause tend to have much higher levels of tau. Uh, granted, there are some areas that just have outliers that might be pulling the effect, but even in these areas that don't really have um, outliers, there seems to be this interesting interaction with age at menopause, particularly earlier age at menopause. Um, Further, we were in, interested in the, oh, sorry. Nope. Um, uh, we were also interested in hormone therapy and whether that might increase. There was a question, um, Nicole. Oh, yeah. Uh, your, your microphone's not working. I, I can't hear you. Do you want to maybe type it in the chat? Yeah, type it in the chat. And I'll, I'll, I'll finish this slide and then we can go to the question. That sounds great. So what we were then interested in was uh, whether hormone therapy might help to increase um, your rate of your your level of protection because the idea would be if you um, you might have had earlier age of menopause but maybe you take hormone therapy which then extends your amount of estrogen exposure throughout life but in fact. Uh, we actually found the opposite. We found that those women who self-reported hormone therapy use showed much higher levels of tau than any other group across many, many regions of the brain, um, particularly in those people who already high, had high levels of amyloid. But that wasn't the, the takeaway point. The takeaway point was actually more interesting because what we showed what, or what we found, we then wanted to look at, okay, well, how long since you started menopause and when you initiated your hormone therapy, how long was the gap? Because there's some evidence to, to suggest that the longer the gap between when you, um, when you took the hormone therapy to when um, you actually went uh, into menopause onset, actually increases your level of risk. This is what the Women's Health Initiative had suggested, that potentially you are at greater risk if you have a long duration between the two, um, suggesting there's been a big gap in estrogen exposure. And here in this yellowish, brownish group, this is the group that's um, started menopause at some time, and then half a decade to a decade later have started um, hormone therapy. These are the women who are really showing the higher levels of tau. And I'll, I'll, I'll take that question Ariel, if, if you've got it. Yeah, um, so Nicole asked, I was wondering if HRT was looked at in your menopausal women. Oh. <laughs> um, but then also asked, were any women in the group that had the youngest age at menopause, um, were they taking HRT? Yeah, it, that's a really good question. We're starting to tease that apart now, um, how these two influence each other. But we certainly noticed that those women who went on earlier um, uh, earlier age at menopause are more likely to go on hormone related therapy. And we're just trying to tease out how to, um, how to best uh, run those analyses without losing power because the more interactions you do in just women, um, the less statistical power we have. I actually have a quick question. As well. Yeah, please, please. Um, when you mentioned um, you were looking at age of menopause, did you yep. also look at you know lifetime ex exposure and um, pregnancies or any of Great question. It's actually a next step because we've done a lot of analyses. Um, we have um, a 
an estimated age from self-report of when they uh, first had their had their first period, um, but it's uh, slightly less reliable. I would say it's it's going to be a little bit difficult to piece that all together, and, and not all the data is available to us. Um, mm -hmm. But it's certainly something we want to look at. And parity is is a really good question. I don't think we have number of pregnancies in this particular cohort, um, but the Framingham Heart Study do, and that's something that we're hoping to look at in relation to tau pet. Great. Great. And, I, and I think you do if you want to look in the prevent AD. Oh, excellent. Yeah, because I, rem I remember we were discussing some of this before, Sylvia. So, yeah, that'd be really great to do. We have that. a couple more questions if you wanted to take them now. Yeah, let's do it. So, um, did you ask about menopausal symptoms? Uh, menopausal symptoms we did and we look all we did was um, so it was a survey and what we did was we grouped it because it was quite um, skewed uh, the outcomes uh, so we ended up grouping it into mild moderate and severe symptoms and all we did at this stage was co-vary for the symptoms we never found a main effect um, but we could look at the interaction with amyloid and see if there's anything but we never found um, severity of symptoms really had um, a huge impact but it is an interesting question given that vasomoto um, symptoms seem to be uh, very much um, a contraindication to some of the hormone therapy findings. And we have one more question here. Um, has there been any breakdown with regard to birth control and, hormonal, and related hormonal dose usage, um, combined pill in particular? Yeah, that is a really, really excellent question because um, there was, I don't know if you guys saw uh, Jessica Gong uh, put out a really great paper from UK Biobank and one of the, um, basically looking at risk for incidence to dementia in the UK Biobank and all of the different reproductive factors that you could think of, one of them being the oral contraceptive. Um, there haven't been many studies um, that have really looked at the oral, con oral contraceptive and one of the issues associated with it is that there's so many different formulations um, and actually it's very uh, birth cohort dependent. So each birth co each generation has had a slightly different way of um, birth control being administered, uh, particularly I'm, I'm referring to the oral contra contraceptive, obviously. Um, yeah. And so uh, it's actually very difficult to sort of look at, but what they had suggested was there was some kind of association between the oral contraceptive and um, incidents with some level of protection inf um, inferred. Um, but again, it's also length of duration. I don't know about you guys, but I was actually on the oral, oral contraceptive from the age of about 16 to 35. And I know that that's different for lots of women. Um, some people are on it for very long periods of time, others for not, not very long at all, uh, which is very different from hormone therapy in some instances. Um, so it's just something that needs to be teased apart. We haven't looked at it yet, but, um, but again, might be something we can look at and prevent AD potentially. Definitely, and even like you were saying, um just the age that you started, especially at puberty, yes, um, would be a huge factor as well. Yeah, but I do think there needs to be very careful analyses done. Um, you know, not necessarily randomized control trials, but uh, I think that it's it's very difficult to look at life course related um, associations because I suppose when we're looking at tau pet, the signal gets very murky when you get down to the age of fifty. Um, so, you know, I guess looking at things that are years on down the line, um, I definitely want to do it, but I'd want to do it in partnership with epidemiologists who do this sort of life course work a lot better than I. Great. So that's all our questions for now. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. No, that's okay. What we might do is um, skip to um, to this slide um, and to sort of uh, sort of do the final piece, which I think. I tend to ignore quite a lot and it's and it's really remiss of me to do so because one huge difference between the sexes is cardiovascular risk and not just not just the amount of burden between men and women because it's obviously at a general level people understand that men tend to have more cardiovascular burden than women but actually it's also in how they express um, uh, cardiovascular so um, men have higher prevalence of hypertension versus women until the age of 64. And then uh, at about, so that's sort of a few years down post-menopause. After that age, the prevalence of hypertension in women skyrockets past men. There's also uh, large artery intracranial occlusive disease um, is the most common stroke subtype. And it's potentially more prevalent in women than men, particularly post-menopause. Diabetes is also a strong risk factor for vascular disease. And there's compelling evidence that the relative risk of vascular disease 
conferred by diabetes is considerably greater in women than men. So it's very important to acknowledge that there might be sort of a survival bias uh, issue associated with men having more cardiovascular burden in some sense. Um, they de definitely show sort of more large vessel disease issues. But, but the fact that post menopause, women have a very changing vascular health story. And, and it is very different in profile to men's. Um, and in fact, for many, many, many years, and, and even now in, in some instances, um, in some contexts, women have uh, less diagnosed, um, less well-diagnosed uh, cardiovascular risk and health um, because their profile is so different. So it's really important to bear that in mind. Um, and these findings here um, were recently published. This is a fantastic um, study published by Sarah Banks's lab that shows that there is a relationship, there's a sex specific relationship between CVD risk and cortical tau um, that really seems to only appear in the females who are E4 carriers relative to the males, suggesting that there might be a biological pathway that's conferring this greater vulnerability to tau via CVD risk in female E4 carriers. And I'm happy to talk about why that might be um, in the question time if anybody's interested. But I guess I'd just like to round out now if I can change the slide, oh gosh, sorry guys, um, by talking about how to tie this all together. So I've, I've, I've labeled a couple of things that might be going on under the hood. So the genes and the hormones, but what might it be that's really conferring this risk between the genetic component and the, the risk of AD pathology or the hormone component and the risk of AD pathology. And here I've listed a couple. There's the metabolic syndrome, which definitely skyrockets post-menopause. There's disrupted sleep and poor mood that's associated with menopause. Cardiovascular risk I just touched on. Hormone therapy, which we just showed findings on. The immune system, which I didn't really talk about a huge amount, but most of those genes that escape inactivation on the X chromosome are associated with immune function. And so there is a story there for um, sex dimorphic immune responses and neuroinflammation to be playing a role, which I think is a very hot topic and one that I would love to hear if anybody's got any data on this or is looking at it, I'd love to hear from you because I think this is the next sort of frontier. And the, the picture of increased risk for dementia as a whole. So what I was just talking about was pathology, but as a whole, for risk of dementia. I think all of these risk factors here were published in this wonderful paper a few years back. I won't dwell on them because actually most of them overlap with what I just uh, was talking about. But I think something we cannot deny and really need to um, sort of contemplate when thinking about sex differences in risk of dementia is this idea of cognitive resilience that I talked about before. Women always perform better than men uh, on most neuropsychological tasks, but also this idea of social determinants of health and gender and what gender and, uh, and sex might be doing together uh, to impact um, our, our understanding of risk of dementia. And to end off, I'd just like to thank um, my, uh, my collaborators. I have uh, many of collaborators, all of whom I'd like to thank very deeply for everything that they've um, helped me with in, in my career. Um, and uh, my funding sources, the National Institute on Aging and Alzheimer's Association. I'd like to thank the study participants and their families and also for the, for the participants, particularly in HABs, um, Framingham, RAP, ADNI and other cohorts. And finally, my other collaborators that I've been working with for only three years um, but they're really fantastic people um, and have kept me excited about science. And that, those are my daughters. Um, great collaborators. I would really recommend you guys working with them, although they're not very good at getting funding. Um, and uh, apart from that, uh, thank you so much. And I'll take any other questions. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much for that insightful talk. Um, so we're going to open the floor to questions. Uh, feel free to raise your hands and continue to post in the chat. Yeah. So we'll start with uh, Fred. Hi, Dr. Roxy. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. It was super interesting. Oh, um, thanks. I actually got a question more regarding the, the very last point that you made on the determinants of health. Um, yep. So how different uh, other factors may interact with uh, like the biological factors to, uh, to, to see it, to, to uh, enact the patterns that we're seeing. So I'm just wondering if, if you've seen any recent research trying to look at this interaction between biological factor and social factors and um, what they tell us about uh, tau and amyloid uh, patterns. 
Yeah. So um, there's not as much in terms of AD pathology, to be honest with you, um, but there, I didn't have enough time to show these slides, um, but there is some really interesting evidence in terms of risk for incidence or risk for cognitive decline, which is suggesting that there might actually be an interesting interplay between, for instance, education level, occup occupational attainment, and also um, childhood socioeconomic status um, that differentiate men and women and their risk of progression. So these factors have all um, seemed to singularly impact women. Um, these are findings from epidemiological studies in um, Sweden and Finland, so in approximately 300,000 to 500,000 individuals. So these are epidemiological findings, um, which I think really speak to this idea that we're not just looking at a biological effect. We are clearly looking at other um, sort of uh, detrimental potentially outcomes that have life course implications down the line. Um, there are also very interesting um, studies that are done by Michelle Milkey and others um, that look at uh, adverse pregnancy outcomes uh, and other things associated with um, sort of life, life course components, epoch components to a woman's life and, and, and how she experiences things um, that have knock on impacts for um, incidence rates and risk for dementia. In terms of relating to AD pathology, um, I, I haven't really uh, seen uh, much um, out there, but if people people are aware of these findings and, and want to um, share them with the group or with me in particular, I'd be really, really grateful. It's something that I would like to do more, uh, the intersection between the gender and the, um, and the sex. But as I said before, I'm not an epidemiologist, so I'd really want to work hand in hand with these people who think about life course um, impacts and social determinants of health and how they really impact um, outcomes. It's a great Thank question. You. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have time for maybe one last quick question, if anyone has any. Yeah, sorry about that. I talked a lot. Um, but if we're all out of questions, then... Um... I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> so it's not going to be a question, but, you know, I think that I really, really like the, your question, Ahir, about the, um, you know, kind of like the pregnancy and things like that. And I think that, so it's not a question, but kind of more like, you know, if we go with your last slide of... Um, one of your last slide of kind of, you know, what's happening in the vascular system. I think that you should really think about not necessarily the vascular diseases per se, but everything that is happening that is different between a man and a woman, right? Mm -hmm. So going back to the pregnancy, like all the vascular changing within pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And then, so I think that there's so like, you know, and then just within the, um, the sick menstrual, menstrual cycle, like, you know, like your vascular system is really kind of, you know, bouncing around depending on where you are and things like that. So, so I have no question, but I think that it's, it's absolutely kind of an area to, uh, to look uh, deeper in. Thanks for the talk. It's a, it's a great point. You know what's interesting, though, the Jessica Gong paper that I referenced um, that I spoke about before, they didn't actually find uh, an increased risk necessarily of, uh, well, they found a potential of increased risk associated with um, having uh, more pregnancies, which was actually um, uh, at odds with some of the other work by Rachel, Rachel Whitmer and colleagues, which suggested there was a protective effect of more pregnancies was associated with greater protection. The idea being that you're more, um, there's more estrogen cycling through the body and uh, during pregnancy, and that might actually give you a bit of a burst of protection. Um, the interesting thing, though, that I thought was really striking with the Jessica Gong paper, though, is that they also looked at how many children men and women had. And they found in both men and women, there was increased risk of dementia if you had two or more children. Just sleep deprivation. Maybe right, right, <laughs> exactly. So then there's, so th this is the reason why I'm so interested in life course and how to model it appropriately because there are lots of different factors, not just the biological components or the, the vascular related issues, although they will be, play an important role, but obviously there's other things associated with having children or, or anything um, that, that will uh, potentially explain some of this and trying to account for that appropriately and not, um, you know, not running away with it um, is important, but great, great point. Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, so we are now out of time. So um, I'll thank you again. Um, did you still have time for like a quick? Yes, I definitely do. And I'd be so excited to, to chat to anyone who's available. So thank you so much for those who, who called in and are gonna jump off now. Lovely to see you, Sylvia. <laughs>